dragons are real. You can buy their chief in Chinese pharmacies. Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald, like other paleontologists before him, knew that among fossil teeth sold as dragon teeth, with a bit of luck one could also find those of fossil species. He visited every Chinese pharmacy he could get to, in Southeast Asia and China, but also in San Francisco and New York. Rao von Königswald was an important mentor in my early career. I first met von Königswald in Clark Howe's Laboratory of Paleoanthropology when von K had come for a visit. And at the time, he invited me to his lab in, at the Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt. Thus, I headed off in 76 on my dissertation collecting trip around the world. I was able to talk with Von K about fossils in his lab, and he told me a story that you have to love the fossils and they will come to you. I never forgot that story. And in fact, I went on to do field work in Java and in China, both places that von Koningswald had worked in his early career. I even went to the Chinese apothecary shops in Hong Kong and elsewhere in China and looked for fossil teeth, just like von Kay had done in the 1930s. I will never forget him. He was an important part of my, of my training as a paleoanthropologist. Of course, von Königswald knew how to differentiate fossil teeth from modern ones. His collection, now in the Senckenberg Research Institute in Frankfurt, contains fossil teeth of horses, elephants, rhinoceros, deers, antelopes, saber-toothed cats, orangutans and many more mammals. Most of the fossils in Chinese drugstore came from cable locations in southern China. However, these fossils cannot be traced back to certain localities. And the age of the fossils is estimated tens of thousands to millions of years ago. I think more sites will be found in the future, because our investigations and excavations continue every year. Some of the dragon teeth turned out to be ape and human-like. Among the first eight teeth von Königswald bought in Hong Kong in the early 1930s was a third molar, a wisdom tooth, larger than that of any orangutan or gorilla. He dubbed it Gigantopithecus blackie in honor of Davidson Black, who had identified Peking Man, also from a single tooth. Later, more Gigantopithecus teeth turned up. A huge jaw found in a cave near Liucheng in China in 1958 finally proved that it was the largest ape that ever lived. No skeletal remains of Gigantopithecus were ever found, no leg bones, no arm bones. Over the past 85 years, since its first identification by von Königswald, the only remains found comprise of four fragmented lower jaws and a few thousand isolated teeth only known from caves in the tower cast formations of southern China and neighboring areas like northern Vietnam. Smaller ancestral species of Giganopithecus are known from India and Pakistan and go almost 10 million years back to the Miocene. The giant Chinese form that we are talking about now is only known from about 2 million years ago the early Pleistocene up to the late middle Pleistocene, but the precise cause of its extinction is still unknown. Estimates throughout the literature are mostly based on mathematical scaling of its teeth and jaws and range from 9 to 12 feet or 2.7 to 3.7 meters in height. Associated weights range anywhere from 200 up to 600 kg. The most commonly accepted body height nowadays is around 3 meters with a body mass of 200 to 300 kg, which is significantly larger than a male silverback gorilla. 
But the only way to really know how big it was is by finding postcranials or bones from its body. Or, if we are really lucky, a complete skeleton. Hopefully one day. What fascinates me is not only its plausible giant body size, but also the mystery surrounding it. This creature is the only relative in our family of great apes that went extinct during the Pleistocene, while all the other four great ape genera, gorillas, chimps, orangutans and humans, are still around today. Fossil teeth of Gigantopithecus are often found together with remains of other animals in the same cave deposits. Such faunal assemblages facilitate the reconstruction of the ecological setting Gigantopithecus lived in. What kind of food and what kind of habitat it lives in? Our study on the enamel stable isotope analysis and the fauna assemblage indicate the giant ape lived in a closed forest ecology and its diet is pure carbon-3 plants. In Pleistocene, we have some strange large teeth which is human-like or ape-like, named as megaanthropos, hemianthropos, and so on. All these great ape fossils in Asia show the great diversity of hominoid in East Asia since later Miocene. However, they have some common features similar to humans, such as thick enamel, longer period of dental development, and life history. Gigantopithecus was our relative, but how close or how distant? Were they human-like or ape-like? We have no remains of hair, of brain or of blood vessels, nothing but a few fragmented teeth. Spectacular new methods developed in the last decades let our tissue tell us the story of these incredible creatures, who they were and how they lived. This information is hidden in their teeth. The molar teeth of Gigantopithecus are huge and they have enamel uh, as much as 3.75 millimetres thick over the cusps. So the obvious questions are how long did that take to grow? And by making a thin section of a tooth we can see increments of daily growth and it turns out it took about 800 days to grow a cusp and as much as four years to grow the whole crown. And besides that, there are stripes or striae in the tooth, which are spaced regularly about 11 days apart. And that matches best, along with the cr long crown formation times, what we see in modern orangutans and some fossil orangutans. So what we use is laser ablation ICPMS, which is a mass spectrometer. The, the laser ablates the surface of the tooth and vaporizes uh, a very, very tiny amount of the tooth that we're able to measure in the mass spectrometer, and we get trace on and, and isotopes. And so I'm very interested in measuring barium, um, strontium as well, and strontium isotopes. So what can I detect with that is the diet of the individual. I can also understand the migration pattern, if they were migrating from different uh, ecological niche, different geographical zone as well. And then we can reconstruct other things, such as um, the breastfeeding. And this is very important to understand the breastfeeding, the timing of maturation of those species, because it tells us, you know, a lot about the interaction, the way, the, the, the community, and, and so on. So, so those information are, are crucial for extinct species to understand a bit better. So in the field of paleoproteomics, we study ancient proteins preserved in skeletal remains, such as bones and teeth. And these ancient proteins are of interest to us for two reasons. The first reason is that they survive longer than ancient DNA, which means that we can retrieve these biomolecules from skeletal remains from hominins and great apes over quite long geological and chronological periods of time. The second reason is that these proteins are composed of an amino acid sequence. And the order in which these amino acids are placed 
in that sequence is determined by the genome, which means that if we read the protein sequence, we are also looking at evolutionary relevant information. When we did this for Gigantopithecus, we saw that among the living great apes, the orangutans are the most closely related um, living species to Gigantopithecus, which is the first time we have direct molecular evidence for such a relationship. We can also see that these sequences are so different from each other that they must have diverged quite distantly in the past, maybe 8 to 10 million years ago, which in turn means that Gigantopithecus has had quite a long independent evolutionary trajectory before it went extinct two or 300,000 years ago. We know Gigantopithecus mainly from China and the Asian mainland. But how large was its range of distribution? Did Gigantopithecus ever reach the equator? We found two gigantic mandibles at Sumatu site, Central Java, in 2014, identified as the first Gigantopithecus specimen from Java. The specimens are fragments of left and right mandibles with molars. The morphology and morph morphometric analysis placed them close to Gigantopithecus blackie. It is suggested that Gigantopithecus came to Java from the Middle East Southeast Asia along with Sino-Malayan fauna migration routes around 1.6 million years ago. For we found also elements of fauna group such as Sinomastodon pumiaiensis at the site. This is an evidence that they had ever migrated across the equator from the north to the south. Gigantopithecus was probably widely distributed in Southeast Asia, formed regional variants and changed its appearance through time. Chinki Sang has discovered the fourth mandible ever found. Hi, I'm Yingqi. We are now in Guangxi searching higher caves for new fossil materials of Gigantopithecus. It's been more than 80 years since von Koenigswald first found Gigantopithecus, but we've never given up on the hunt. Because if we want to completely unravel the mystery of this giant ape, we have to find its skull and postcranium. Based on the statistical analysis on the size of Gigantopithecus' teeth, it tends to become larger during Pleistocene, and its dental morphology also tends to become more complicated, probably as an adaption to the changing climate. But we don't know for sure yet why it went extinct at the end of the Middle Pleistocene. Gigantopithecus became extinct. But what about Bigfoot, Yeti and King Kong? Everyone has heard of these legendary gigantic apes. Is it possible that historic Homo sapiens still saw Gigantopithecus roaming around and this knowledge survived in our collective memory until today? Early in my career, I was certain that Gigantopithecus and Homo erectus had met up in the past. In fact, I wrote a book and several papers on the topics. More recent research has shown, though, that these two species lived in very different habitats and could not have met. A second question comes up regarding Homo sapiens. Could Homo sapiens have interacted with Gigantopithecus? And we can simply answer that question by talking about dates. Homo sapiens didn't reach China until after 80,000 years ago, long after Gigantopithecus was extinct. Gigantopithecus should not remain the only very robust creature Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald discovered. There was more to come. <laughs>